Amen. This year, as you all know, we're going to spend the year talking about worship and discipleship and, and study and how we want to be vital, we want to be healthy, we want to be strong, we want to be knowledgeable, we, we want to be excited participants in worship and uh, discipleship and, and service. I've particularly been spending a lot of time on, on this myself in my personal study, and um, God's made it perfectly clear to me that uh, I'm a lousy worshiper. And, um, and I knew that before he told me. I'm a very distracted person. Even in the middle of a prayer, praying, my mind will go off on a tangent. And I know some of you are like that too. See, but what God's telling me is He says, I want, I want everything you have when you come before me. I want, I want all of you. I want every thought. I want every breath. I want every ounce of your being focused on me. And that's not easy. That's not easy. So we're going to be on a journey this year in each of our lives to, to become more healthy in these three areas. And all of us will have different places within them that we need to focus on. And if you need a reason why it's worth focusing on, it's because God is worth it. I mean, if you truly, honestly believe in Him and believe that He created the heavens and the earth and, breathed the, and believe that He breathed life into man and woman and believe that He... He found a way to bring us back to Him after we as a, as a race of humanity turned our backs on Him. Bring us back to Him through Jesus Christ. That's what makes it worth it. That's what makes being a vital, healthy Christian worth it. Today we look at discipleship. Now discipleship is in many ways like a, a coin. It's got a front and a back, a head and a tail. And we're going to look at both those sides of discipleship today. We're going to look at some scripture. And again, as we do this, I want you to be evaluating yourself. Say, okay, where am I in line with these scriptures? Where am I in a in a um, health spectrum in this area of my life? Am I healthy and vital when it comes to discipleship or, or am I anemic and unhealthy when it comes to discipleship? Well, the first side of the coin for discipleship is study. And I've got some scriptures that I want to point out to you all. The first one is our text scripture today. Romans 12, 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, what does renewing your mind mean? I've heard the saying before, good stuff in and bad stuff out. That's, that's the renewing of our mind. It is, is taking in God and his wisdom, and his knowledge, and his word, and getting out of our mind the things of this world. The things that the world says are wonderful, but God says are inconsequential. 
I love Despicable Me too. Okay? And my girls loved American Girl dolls. But just like the kids, as they were going through these pictures that Elizabeth showed them, I bet not one of them said, I bet there's a picture of Jesus in there. And I'm going to wait for that. <laughs> I doubt any of the adults did. And, and the question is, why? Well, you know, we don't always think of him first. Because we haven't put enough of him in to force the other stuff out. So many of you have those old tapes playing in your heads. Things that maybe mom or dad told you when you were young about yourself that aren't and weren't ever true. You'll never amount to anything. You're not smart enough to go to college. You can't do it. Can't you do anything right? Some of you have those tapes playing. But see, God wants us to get rid of that and fill ourselves with the goodness of His Word that says you are a blessed child, a redeemed child, a loved child of God. The only way to get that in is to renew our minds. Well, God knew that when He talked to Moses on the mountain and Moses came down and shared with the Israelites the law. If you take your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 6, we'll look at some of that. We're going to start in verse 6. This is Moses giving the commands to the people. He says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Renew your minds. They had just spent 400 and some odd years in Egypt being flooded by the Egyptian culture, the Egyptian religion, the, the Egyptian mindset. And God said, it's time to get that out of you. But you can only get that out of you if you concentrate and remember and study what I'm telling you today. Keep my word on your heart. Teach your children. Think about it every day. When you're sitting at home when you're on the way to work, on the drive to vacation, let your mind focus on me. He went on to say, tie them on your, on your arms and your forehead and put them on your doorposts. Those are actually Jewish traditions that are still carried out today. The tying of the, the God's word on their arm and, and on their forehead are called phylacteries. I don't know if you've ever heard that word before. And, and put them on the doorposts of your homes and on your gates. Those are called mezuzahs. Have you ever been to a home before and, and saw a little decorative item right on the doorpost? Sometimes they're glass, sometimes they're ceramic. That's a mezuzah. Inside the mezuzah are these scriptures that I just read to you. And inside the phylacteries that conservative Orthodox Jewish men wear, there's a picture of it, is this very scripture. 
I think what God was saying is, find tangible ways to focus on me. So that you might renew your mind. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this. I've got the King James and the New International Version. Most of us are probably most familiar with the King James Version. Where it says, show, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show yourself approved. Paul was saying it's important to know God's Word. Timothy, a young man, just starting out in his faith, just starting out in his ministry, just starting out in his adult life. And Paul says, study. New International Version says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. How can you correctly handle the word of truth? By being familiar with it. Which goes back to Deuteronomy. And having God's word in your heart and in your mind and on your mouth is what renews your mind. Which is our text scripture today. Now that's the first side of the coin when we talk about discipleship, study. The second side of the coin is discipling. And that's the root word, disciple. When we think about it, John the Baptist had disciples. We're fairly confident that Andrew and Philip were disciples of John the Baptist before they discovered Jesus. Jesus had disciples. We see in the scripture his choosing of the 12, uh, the sending out of the 72, the sending out of the 120, and the multitudes that followed him, all disciples of Jesus. Paul had his disciples, Timothy and John Mark. So when we think about disciple, we think about somebody who, who helps to Teach us God's Word. How many of you, rhetorical question, how many of you can remember a name of your teacher when you were in fifth or sixth grade? Now, even most adults will remember a favorite teacher. Why? Because they impacted your life. Maybe it was a formative time for you. Uh, maybe they were just incredibly connected to you somehow. They took time. They cared about you. Maybe they were just a great teacher. And even now at 30, 40, 50, 70, you still remember Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. That's what discipleship is. The, the kids have a math teacher. In a sense, they're that math teacher's disciple when it comes to addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, algebra, calculus. They're discipling in the study of math. If you're taking a literature class, you're discipling under that teacher in literature. And it doesn't mean that teacher knows everything. No teacher is perfect. But you sit in that classroom and you sit under that teacher and you take in what they give you. What well, should be no different spiritually? We have Sunday school teachers who are teaching in our Sunday school classes. In a sense, those in the class are discipling under that Sunday school teacher. If you go to uh, the women's Bible study that's offered a couple times a year, whoever's facilitating or, or whoever's leading on the video, in a sense you're discipling under that individual as they teach God's Word. Now in American culture, see, we don't like to put ourselves under anybody else. We don't like to submit to authority. Or to admit that somebody knows more than me. 
But in a sense, that's what discipleship is all about. When we talk about Jesus calling his disciples, it's recorded in, in Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 19. I have just a snippet of that. It says, Jesus went up on the mountainside and called those he wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed the twelve. Now, we've got several different pictures of, of the calling of the twelve throughout the scriptures. But here what we have is that Jesus has many disciples gathered around him. He has called some to come and follow him and be fishers of men. But at this point, he separates out from that larger group 12 for himself. And he says, in these 12, I am going to pour more of my wisdom and knowledge into than I can with all of them. And they became his disciples. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, we see Jesus giving the command to go. He was getting ready to go back to heaven. And he wanted to make sure that they understood that the game wasn't over. So he said, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So now we've got both sides of the coin right there. Go and find people who are willing to listen and to submit themselves to you as you teach them about me. Jesus, God. And, and, and that doesn't stop with the 12. At this point it was 11. But it doesn't stop with them. That's an ongoing process down through history. To where today we have spiritual leaders teaching our children, teaching our adults, preaching from pulpits leading revivals that are doing their very best to live this very scripture out to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, I, I want to I draw a line clear so nobody's getting the wrong idea here. Okay? No one is John's disciple. We are all Jesus' disciples. But if I'm leading a Bible study, and you come to that study, hopefully you go, well, John's put a lot of energy in this, and, um, and he's studied this, and, and you know, I'm going to be open-minded that this might actually be out of the Bible. It's not, oh, John's the best thing in the world. Whatever he says goes. Uh, you know, what out of his mouth comes, comes the word of God. No, that's cults. And we're not there. So whether it's me leading a Bible study or preaching a sermon or you teaching a Sunday school class or the ladies having a Bible study or the men having a Bible study or us doing vacation Bible school Whatever it might be, we are to study hard to present God's word to those who have come to hear it. And then they're to take that word and they're to chew on it and to find out where it fits in their life. And, and then there, or you all, are, are to take that word out and share it again. It really is the only gift that keeps on giving. God's Word. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what region of the country you live in. Or what country on earth you call home. We are to go and make disciples. That's what they did. And we can see in Acts chapter 2. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
The disciples have now gone out to make disciples. And multitudes are coming to them to learn about God and about Jesus. We can look at Peter's life and we know he didn't have it all together. We can look at Paul's life and know he didn't have it all together. They were men just like you and I are men and women. But they took what God gave them in their imperfect vessels and they went out and shared. And people came to faith. In Titus, you want to open your Bible to the book of Titus, which is just right before Hebrews. Chapter 2 really talks about this concept of discipling and teaching. I've got just a little bit, but I want to read more of the chapter here. This is Paul talking to Titus, and he says, You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. And we've got admonitions throughout the New Testament in the epistles that say, if somebody's preaching something contrary than what you heard from me, or what you know is the truth, don't listen to them. That's why Paul is telling Titus, make sure you're teaching sound doctrine. Because I've already told the people not to listen to you if you don't. So make sure that you know what you're talking about before you start sharing it with others. And he goes through the series of, of the entire church or even human race, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. And women can teach? Uh, yeah, it says right here. He's teaching and they're teaching. These are the mature individuals of, of the church, the older men and the older women. They have a responsibility to continue to teach God's Word too. Church isn't an oligarch, olig, oligarchy. Am I using that right, Steve? Does that mean like one person in charge? And a, I, think, I think that's the word. Okay. You don't see a crown on my head. Okay, I'm not the boss of you. If there's something that I teach that you go, you know what, that's, that's just not right. You have a responsibility to come to me or to go to one of the deacons and to say, you know, John was off there. That's, just not, that's not sound doctrine. Because you have a responsibility to everybody else who heard it too. And I have a responsibility to make sure I'm teaching sound doctrine. So in the event that I'm not, you're responsible to correct me. And I'm responsible to make a correction. That's, that's, what, he's telling, that's what he's telling Titus here. Make sure you're teaching sound doctrine so that they can teach sound doctrine too. He goes on to say, uh, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure. Talking about the older women teaching the younger women. Then he says, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Set them an example by doing what is good in your teaching. Show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. He's had such a wonderful model for Titus to follow and develop in his church. Which is, is in a sense, we are all teachers. And we are all teaching different people different things. And we all must set an example of the truth. Every teacher has a student. At any given time, each of us should be a student as well as a teacher. There is someone here 
or in your community or somewhere that you need to be discipling under. And likewise, there is someone here or in your community that you need to be discipling. Now, some people say, oh, no, I don't know about that. What if they're a brand new Christian and they've never read the Bible before and they don't know anything? They can still tell somebody what Jesus did for them. And they can go, what, you know, I'm a brand new Christian. I just bought my first Bible. I hardly know anything, but I know this, that Jesus loves me. And that he saved my soul. And there are people who don't know that, that that one person who doesn't know anything else about Christianity or about God or about the Bible can still teach, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. So we are all students and we are all teachers. And we are, are all responsible to that calling. So those that you mentor under, those that you disciple under, you have a responsibility to submit yourselves to their teaching. Until they show themselves unsound. And if you, have a, if you have a responsibility as a teacher, in any role that you have on earth, you have a responsibility to be a sound teacher. A self-controlled teacher. A teacher above reproach. That can be in a classroom. That can be in, a, in, a, in an office building. That can be uh, in a conference center. That can be in a teleconference. That can be in a church Sunday school or anything in between. Our goal this year is to become vital disciples of God. And again, for each of us, that's going to look a little bit different. And who we disciple under is going to be a little bit different. And who we disciple is going to be a little bit different. But we are all called to that responsibility. Amen. As we prepare for our invitation this morning, my question for you is, are you giving God your all in the area of discipleship? Now, you don't have to go from zero miles per hour to 120 miles per hour before you get out of the sanctuary. But you have to start the engine and, and press on the gas a little bit. Grown ups, you remember teaching your kids how to drive? And that first time they got in the driver's seat and you're over on the other side going, I sure hope this roll bar is solid. And, and they start that car up and they press the gas and the car goes, rrr, rrr. and you go, oh my gosh, what have you done? You've given them the freedom to learn. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the freedom to learn. And we're going to make mistakes along the way. And my kids have brought dented cars home more times than I care to remember. You know, but it's a learning process. I've dented cars. Okay? I've made the same mistakes they do. I've been down the same roads they've been down. Roads of life. But I still have a responsibility to teach them. And then having taught them to get on the other side of the car and to let them drive. Now, my foot still slams on the brake in the passenger side. Where there is no brake pedal to push. I even do that with Donna. That's my issue. Okay? But never once have I ever tried to scoot over to the middle and put my foot on the gas or the brake while they're driving the car.
Now, two of my daughters are grown. They're adults. For the most part, living their own adult lives. And it's hard to let go. But at some point, the teacher must let the student go and call another student to their side. That's what we're talking about here. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, there's one here who doesn't know Him. Today's the day to accept Him. And to say, God, I am... I am so unworthy. And I know so little, but I know this. That you are real. That Jesus died for my sins. That He rose again to allow me the opportunity to ask... Will you save me? And Jesus, Jesus and God and the heavenly hosts rejoice. And God only has one answer for that. And the answer is always yes. Today's the day to accept Him.